everybody. This is Dr. Hassan Sadri, board certified ophthalmologist and um, one of the co-founders of Visionary Ventures. Um, I'm located in Newport Beach, California. We're here at the OIS 12, which is phenomenal. And congratulations to everybody, including Craig and Maureen for putting another great team, great meeting. Um, I'm really excited about my next guest. Um, uh, John is a, what I call outsider of ophthalmology. He has a fresh perspective. For those of you who don't know him, uh, he'll tell you a little bit about himself, but um, we're going to be talking about Avelino today um, and how it's really making an impact on my patients and our patients when it comes to refractive surgery and what their vision is for um, digitization of uh, healthcare. So without further ado, uh, welcome. How are you doing? Good. Good to see you. Thank you for uh, taking the time here. You did a great job on your presentation. Um, for those of uh, our colleagues that don't know you, tell us about yourself a little bit. Yeah, well, I uh, first of all, I'm delighted to be in this uh, in this uh, business now because and I wish I'd done it 20 years earlier. Uh, <laughs> but uh, 20 years earlier, I was actually on Wall Street. Uh, so I come from what's uh, politely called capital markets. But those markets um, entirely de depend on data yeah. to operate. And uh, you have to measure risk. Uh, you have to look for opportunity and you have to create innovation. And all of that comes from the uh, precise use of data from all sorts of different sources, whether it's real time from the stock exchange or it's research from analysts or it's uh, automated, massively powerful computing, taking millions of uh, data points and creating, uh, looking for small opportunities to trade. So it's a massively data dependent business and it's created a very fine tuned, uh, well uh, structured marketplace globally. Um, and those, those data points are really used to manage risk as much as they are opportunity. And so if you look at this industry and all the research, all the data points and the genetic data that's uh, available within Avellino, we look at Avellino as a business that uh, is, is really focused on genetics. We do a lot in genetics. But interestingly, uh, it looks like a data business to me because we have to aggregate research, we have to aggregate data from a variety of different sources, and our own testing generates data that we can, uh, we can use to, to fill out the, the uh, resources we have to really analyze precisely what can we do in a particular disease area, whether it's keratoconus, it might even be uh, oncology. We also have incredible breakthroughs that we've made just using machine learning and AI to really understand what discoveries in common are there within this massive big database of uh, um, content that we have. So, you know, the, the world in, in, on the East Coast says that data is the new oil. Uh, yeah. And I think in medicine, we're about to say the same thing. Data is the new oil. And uh, from it, we can generate diagnostics that are accurate and we can generate therapeutics. So it's a super exciting journey. So, so let's talk about that. Let's unpack that a little bit because I think um, that's a really good overview. Um, I, feel, I feel like the, there's a paradigm shift, right? We've been sort of, you know, using a shotgun effect on patients. You know, this works, this may not work. Right. And um, tell us about that because there's limit, you know, with the markets, as you know, better than I do with how volatile things are and right. down market, if you will. Yeah. And it looks like it's going to be like that for another 12, 14 months. How do you do more with less? How do yeah. you, and how do you focus? So you're, you're exactly right. That's why there's the term precision medicine. Yeah. Uh, because you want that rifle shot at a very specific uh, problem to get very clear diagnosis of what the right treatment should be, not for the general population, which is where we've been up until now. You see, you observe these, these uh, factors, you treat them with this. Sometimes it works brilliantly. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it actually can hurt a patient. Uh, and so there are lots of other factors going in uh, to how a, an individual patient lives. First of all, they may have a, um, a specific area in which they live, which uh, amplifies a condition, uh, the likelihood of something happening. Um, they may come from a different culture. So if you're Hispanic or you're African-American or you're Caucasian or you're um, uh, you know, China, you know, from Asia, uh, you've got genes that are different. And they're all a factor in uh, how we should be analyzing you. So we, we, we create a risk score based on a large number of genes. And then we add in uh, other factors, including where you live and what culture you come from. Um, but now, I think the real opportunity is to take all the other data, mm -hmm. the, not just the research that we're drawing from, there's tons of great valuable data out there. So for us to create science based on research and just use machine learning and AI to, to really explore it, 
we're also able to take uh, other data that comes from instrumentation that is out already in doctor's offices, which is now being captured as data mm -hmm. and is useful. It's numbers and we can figure out a way to put those together in combination and create analytics, which will give even more insight into where a patient is going on their journey. We can look at where they've been, where they are today, and even be predictive about how their condition is going to work uh, uh, against various, various different treatments. Um, so it's super interesting. It's, it is fascinating. And I think it'll be interesting as we, you know, there's not a day that goes by when we have patients in the clinic that are shocked that, for instance, glaucoma, they're, they're shocked that genetic, if there's a huge genetic component to, right, to, yeah. for their offspring. Yeah. And I think it has huge implications of not just the patient in the chair, but also just educating their patients and their families. But also you can dollarize that, right? You can, you can actually now have awareness of that and be able to prevent disease, which, yeah. is, which is really where you're going with this, I think. Yeah, you're exactly right. Which is phenomenal. No, because exactly you've been right. so reactive, right, in yeah. medicine. Yeah, well, you know, that family angle is really important. Pediatrics are a really important market. We found that as we talk to those, those the pediatric uh, physicians that are looking into this space, they want to see what a parent might have donated to their children through a genetic uh, disorder that's still not presented. But if you can get there early, and start to diagnose uh, and treat that very early in the, the idea is to get out in advance as early as possible to diagnose an individual patient's condition. Yes. And that informs the doctor on you know, the very best treatment courses that should be applied to this child. And you can continue to monitor their progress. When you've got that static base of knowledge. This, this individual has these specific characteristics unique to him or her. And you feel, okay, so now let's talk about that. These, so this is sort of, what I call, I still have a day job with seeing patients and most physicians that do. There's there's this innovation cycle and modernization, and, and this is amazing. And then, but who's paying for it? So how does that work? Are, are, do, you feel, do you feel like as a company, you're running into some headwinds on, on the, the way the, the healthcare is approaching this? Do they buy into it? Are they giving you pushback? Yeah, as far it's as a great question. It's a great question. We've sort of had to create this space, <laughs> right? Especially right. By the way, I'm glad you're economically oriented so you could actually push back on them because yeah, yeah. the science guys just fold like me. We just fold. No, no, no. So we, uh, um, I think we had to do a number of things that a bigger company would have done uh, more easily perhaps, but we've stuck with it and being persistent and committed to creating awareness, for example, of keratoconus. I, uh, people here have said to me, you know what? That was really underdiagnosed. People didn't really think about it for a while. Now there's a test. Ah, we can actually think about it. And it's raised its profile. Mm -hmm. So we've, uh, we've done a lot with a very small resources, but with a very strong fundamental science. You're talking that, about the AVA gene. That, yeah, yeah. We yeah. think uh, that works. We, 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 we were fortunate, actually, because we use um, PCR testing for our test. Mm -hmm. It's actually a, a, a swab, yeah. just like you would in the COVID test. Yeah. And in fact, we turned our, our, our business towards COVID for a while because there was no private companies out there offering COVID tests in January of 2020. We were the first ones to be given it. We used all the science we were using in the eye space and pivoted, working with a local fire station initially, mm -hmm. and then it just exploded. That's amazing. And, I uh, read about that. I, I talked to, I think Mazo was involved at the time. Yeah. He was telling me about that. Yeah, it was a crazy thing. And he was, uh, <laughs> he was uh, really good. So we managed to get a um, yeah. significant amount of revenues without getting independently funded to do this. So we've been able to follow the path uh, and pursue it. You're right, though. It's an economic uh, journey. So what's next? So tell me, okay, so what are you excited about? Tell, tell us a little bit about where the company is going. What is your vision? So from a product point of view, we see a library of products coming out from the same basic core data platform. Um, this year, we're launching Glaucoma, as I, as I mentioned earlier. And we believe that's a huge opportunity for people to really get on top of that particular condition. Um, we have AMD coming at the end of the year. So the eye space continues to be a, uh, a real focus for us. But as I said earlier, uh, we have a great deal of knowledge in infectious diseases. We work with uh, you know, hundreds of uh, um, uh, care institutions for people that are vulnerable. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a you know, very developed lab process and uh, that all works beautifully. But the real engine is the data engine. And we've been gathering data from around the world. And we went on a science experiment to see if we could do something in oncology. Mm -hmm. And for a year, we were getting these results. We're like, that just can't be true. That can't be true. Mm -hmm. And it is true. 
And so we've had, uh, we've had doctors that have grown up in oncology saying, you know what, you came about this completely Different. from the wrong place. Yeah. Uh, but you've had, because of that, yeah. you've made a discovery and it's all hidden in the data. Yeah. So our focus is to work with as many partners as we can to aggregate uh, their data. And I've had people here say to me, we got this, actually, we've been collecting data for 10 years. We just don't know what to do with it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And there's two parts of not knowing what to do with it. One yeah. is, how do I make it compatible with everyone else's data? So that's, you know, you come from New York Stock Exchange or you come from a big data aggregator. Or, uh, I've done a lot of work in this. Uh, normalizing and aggregating data is something that we grew up with. We can do that for this, for this industry. And we are doing it. And uh, as I said, the results, we can just see a pathway ahead that's going to be full of discovery. But we can't do it alone. We need to do it with industry partners, with the community of doctors. We need to find people that are interested in using you know, genetic diagnostics in their practice and working with us to involve. And that's certainly what's happened with keratoconus. We had an incredible relationship. This group, this community, by the way, is a lot more friendly than any other community I've yeah. worked with. Yeah, this is like the, exchange, yeah, yeah. the exchange of ideas, yeah. the willingness to uh, you know, uh, risk asking each other questions out loud. That's, that's really... Very collaborative. Really, really collaborative. I'll tell you a funny story. I, I, I had a medical student two weeks ago that I sent in for a lab. He had high cell, cylinder astigmatism. Actually, it turns out he has keratoconus. He was looking to do LASIK surgery and we decided not to. This yeah. would not be available yeah. you know, 15 years ago. Yeah, oh, so, that's exactly where we started. Ago, five years we ago, started so. in Asia yeah. because keratoconus was, good with, it was a, a, yeah. a, you know, a high-risk event out there. Yeah. And so it's part of the course of care for laser treatment. Yeah. You take that test and yeah. you decide if you're doing it or not. I'm just super excited and uh, I want to congratulate you and your yeah. team. Well, you've been so welcoming. I really appreciate the uh, uh, conversations we've had already offline here. So uh, Absolutely. Uh, you're typical, I think, of this great community we have. So keep going with your work. It's Thank terrific. You. Thank you so much. It's All right. Been great. A pleasure. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. We're here with my really good friend, Dr. Georgia. How are you doing? Doing wonderful. Thank you for having me. Everyone knows who you are. Do they? So, yeah, okay. they do. But tell them a little bit about like your background. How did you get into ophthalmology and, and what, what's exciting? What, draw, what drew you to Dompe? That's a great question. So I'm a pharmacist by training um, and I actually specialize in specialty eye care compounding, which is a very niche part of pharmacy. And I remember the days where I was at Mass Sinear doing my training and we were compounding serum tears for the first time. And it was a really unique experience because it was actually for a patient with neurotrophic keratitis. Wow. And for me, I never thought in my lifetime that there would be a specific treatment indicated for neurotrophic keratitis where some company would invest in research and development for such a rare disease. And so for me, it all kind of came together really interestingly because that's kind of how I started my career was in an area where we were compounding whatever we could for neurotrophic keratitis at the time to now being able to oversee the Global Medical Affairs Organization at a company that actually dedicated research and development to building out a program in NK. That's amazing. So the, I, I love that connection that you have from your background as a pharmacist. So as a as a global uh, leader for the MSLs, tell us a little bit about that. We were going to talk about that a little bit later, but since you brought it up, how does that work? What's the role of MSLs now? Number one, number two, how what what's what's going on with with the reduction in number of let's say budgets? Is that affecting them? And how are they connecting with the docs? Yeah, it's a great question. I think the environment has just changed dramatically, not only in ophthalmology, but a variety of therapeutic areas, especially with the current environment. I think the MSLs, as well as other pharma you know, um, colleagues have challenges getting out there and being able to educate in a really clear, concise way where, because doctors have less time and they, and they can't do it in office. And so for me, really the MSL team serves as that scientific partner to a physician so they can make informed clinical decisions for their patients as it relates to NK, also as it relates to our products. I think the most important role MSLs really serve is to ensure that as science is becoming available, that the physicians are at the forefront of it and that they get access to it, whether it's through a publication that maybe is not open access or through education you know, at a regional meeting or at a national meeting or even just during a one-on-one -on -one meeting, I'm really making sure that physicians have what they need so they can better serve their patients. That's terrific. I, I mean, in my career, it's been terrific because, you know, there's a lot of times you're just kind of stuck and you need some yeah. advice as far as the, the, the scientific and the reps certainly don't know. And it's really a nice, I think it's a huge value add. So I'm glad that you're actually expanding that. So let's talk about the, what I thought was really unique to what your guys are doing at Dompe, which is you're doing a lot of different things. 
Um, and I think patients, actually the clinic lab used it, it's been terrific. Tell us about Leonardo. Tell us about this supercomputer, which is I think the fourth fastest computer I read somewhere in the world. Um, how are you utilizing it? And how are you using it in ophthalmology? You know, it's funny, a lot of people don't know this about Dompe, but we've invested in a platform, we call it the Escalate platform. And this platform uses AI, supercomputing technology, really to take old molecules that people may have kind of put on the back burner or have gone generic, so they don't think about them a lot anymore. And they put them through this computing system where it can really come up with new applications for old molecules. And even maybe some molecules that had never been applied to in a therapeutic setting before. And so really the technology is quite amazing. And I think what Dompe is doing, and we did this during COVID, like many companies, we were just trying to find solutions for patients. I think what we're doing is we're taking this technology and really focusing on where we can find solutions where there's really high unmet medical needs. So the way that the system works is you kind of put in what your end goal is or what you're looking for, but at the same time, it can almost get you to a new end goal by finding new applications for things that we've kind of maybe forgotten about. Pretty remarkable. I mean, the, the, you know, we talk about applications of supercomputers, AI, yep. and just be able to use that for our patients. And then, so lastly, tell me about, I know we don't have a lot of time, but tell me about what's really exciting about Dompe. What's coming out of the pike? Educate us. You know, I really think that the way Dompe harnesses innovation is very different. Um, we've been able to do it without barriers because we are a privately held company. We have one shareholder and that's our CEO, Sergio Dompe. And so for us on the scientific and R&D teams, what we're really excited about is the fact that we can take nerve growth factor, which is a neurotrophin that kind of has been thought about as, you know, there may be a potential utilization of it. We got it approved in neurotrophic keratitis. Now really taking that same molecule and applying it in new indications we're studying Sjogren's dry eye disease I saw that. with the application of nerve growth factor, which I'm really excited about because as many know in this field is that Sjogren's dry eye is a little bit different. There are some neurosensory components. There are definitely inflammatory components, but there's also this kind of aqueous deficient component. And these patients are more complicated to treat than, you know, your average dry eye evaporative sure. patient. And so for us, we're really hoping to be able to come up with new indications for the application of NGF and Sjogren's with the Protego studies is just step one, which they were recently completed. So we'll be hopeful to present some data in around April timeframe, maybe at one of the upcoming conferences. Well, ASCRS, maybe. At ASCRS. Very mm -hmm. good, which is also here in San Diego. Is well, it in San Diego this is. year? Well, well it's back. great we'll, to see you. I will see you back here again then. Absolutely, we'll do it again. Wonderful, thank Cheers. you so much for Absolutely. having us. Absolutely, congratulations. Thank you. My next guest is um, a very good friend. Um, I've known him through his activities with the fund Visionary Ventures, which you guys know I'm part of. Um, and he's just been a great partner, just super nice guy and really smart, um, intelligent uh, investor. So uh, without further ado, I want to introduce yourself. For those of you who don't know you, um, tell us a little bit, about Tyler, about who you are and who's Bluestem. Okay. My name's Tyler Stowater. I'm a partner at Bluestem Capital. We're located in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And we've been in business now for about 30 years. Uh, and it was only recently that we actually got involved in making uh, investments in the eye care space prior to that. And we still do make investments in other areas, but I mean, it was anything from apartments to hotels, light manufacturing, uh, software companies. And uh, as I said earlier, uh, Vance Thompson was the gentleman that got us involved in, uh, in the eye care space. Uh, it was probably about seven years ago, Vance, who I've known for a long time, you know, and it been persistent. It, you know, he <laughs> said, you need to take a look at this space. And we said, no. And finally he goes, I've got a company you need to take a look at. And it was a neural lens and it was a company that Andy Corley at the time was out raising money for. And uh, you know what? We ended up providing Andy's Series B round of financing to that company. And Andy goes, I like you guys. There's another company and another group of people out there called Visionary Ventures that you need to go know. And you know, we ended up, and I, we probably made better part of a dozen co-investments with Visionary Ventures over the years. You know, and then that led to relationships with Dr. Dick Lindstrom and and Bill Link. So, you know, it's one of the major reasons why we enjoy this space is we've been able to partner with really good people. You know, we're generalists by nature at Bluestem. You know, as I said, we invest in a lot, you know, a lot of industries. 
And, uh, and so we look to partner with people that really are industry experts. And that's why uh, we found a uh, good space here because we picked really good partners to partner. I mean, you have a great brand. Uh, you've been great partners to many of the folks you mentioned, including uh, Visionary. But what's interesting about you and your philosophy is you're in other things, real estate. And it's, um, it's so interesting to me personally because, you know, a lot of us probably do a little bit of that too. We diversify, yep. right, on our own portfolios. Yep. Um, how do you mitigate uh, losses um, and especially the down market and where are you going from here like let's say this this down market is 12 months 14 months as, as you stated uh, on the panel what does that look like the next few months in the horizon you know what I think that's why our investors uh, trust us because to be honest with you as one of my partners said you know what we're really just a private mutual fund and by having a little diversity within our fund across various industries and across different you know, where we've got early stage companies and we've got investments that are maybe look more like a traditional PE investment. We're not, I mean, so, you know, at the end of the day, we're capitalist. I mean, we'll invest in early stage businesses. And we've done that with Dr. Dick, Dick Lindstrom, where we've done a couple of seed stage investments. And we've got other investments that are more traditional. They're already producing, uh, uh, revenue producing positive net income, you know, the, the management team's looking to take out the owners and we'll partner with them. And it actually makes for a very nice, diverse portfolio, which is one of the things that helps shield us when you have events like we're realizing right now where yeah. we got a down market going on, but we yeah. have a diverse portfolio yeah. that helps us weather Yeah, that. and it's interesting, you know, that private markets have really been kind of shielded. Yeah. away from that, right? From the valuation yeah. standpoint. Yeah, we just sold a company yeah. yesterday at very, at very nice terms, Yeah, but it was a manufacturing business. Yes, and you look like a rock star. Yep. In rock star here. Yeah. <laughs> very good. So where do you go from here? What is the next, What's what are you excited about? What's next for you? You know what? Uh, this is a great industry. I mean, I, I love ophthalmology, ophthalmology yeah. but I love making investments. You know what? The great thing is we're always constant. If you're not learning, you're not moving forward. Yeah. And and so there's always the opportunity to learn. There's always this cutting edge stuff going on. Now, the bar's just a little higher in making new investments because you just got to be a little more cautious. As I said earlier on the stage, nobody wants to catch a falling knife. No. And so everybody's just being a little cautious uh, about making new investments. And it's not even finding a new investment that you want to make. But you got to make sure that you got the right management team, you got the right board, and most importantly in today's environment, you got a great strong cap table because it's one thing for you to want to make the investment, but you got to fill out the round and then you got to feel comfortable that the people around the table, uh, if things aren't, don't move forward in the economy as fast as we, yeah, uh, that you'd want them to, and the company needs to raise more money, that the people around the uh, table have the bandwidth to make, continue Absolutely. to move the forward, company forward. You don't want to be the only one sitting at the table having to fund the company. I've I, been there. That's not any fun. That's not a fun, yeah, that's not a fun uh, position. Well, I think we're out of time. I have a lot more to talk to you about. We'll do it. We'll invite you again, hopefully, next time. Thank you. And uh, again, I wish you a wonderful, happy new year. You too. Thank you. Great job. I'm just absolutely delighted to have my next guest here, Eric Schlemp from, from Florida, who just did a great presentation on neuroprotection. I was on panel afterwards and we were talking about the potential, not just in glaucoma, because that's something that we've always talked about, but, you know, AMD, cornea and all the other parts of the eye. So, um, Eric, it's just I'm absolutely delighted to have you here. How are you Thank doing? You. I'm doing great. Thanks. So I know you, but a lot of people who don't know you, sure. can you tell them about, you know, your background yeah, and uh, sure. what, how'd you start Stuart Pharmaceuticals and also when did you, why ophthalmology? Yeah, so uh, I have a varied background. I've been a startup and early stage guy most of my life, um, a lot of different industries. I spent a lot of time in management consulting and advised major pharma companies on drug development, which is kind of how I got interested in this area and was working in a pathology laboratory in LA when I made the decision to come out here and join my partner, Bob Barada and we founded Stewart Therapeutics. Um, we licensed the technology from the University of Wisconsin, which is a college in mimetic, and it's uh, 
got some pretty interesting properties as we talked about in our discussion on neuroprotection. Uh, and we've also got a candidate for dry eye disease that uh, finished a phase two trial very successfully. Um, the technology has applicability in a lot of disease indications, but uh, Bob's an ophthalmologist, so it was pretty obvious we were gonna end up there. Uh, I think uh, what's exciting about this technology is that it is a uh, first-in-class drug. Nobody does this. Uh, it has uh, got a profound effect on the tissues involved, and uh, we see that effect in the phase two clinical trial and in all the preclinical work that we've done in neuroprotection. Terrific, I mean, and I saw the SD100 you have, Yep. You have so many shots on goal. How do you, with you know, with the down markets right now, we yeah, were just right. talking about, how do you um, do more with less? Yeah, I, I think we've gone through a couple of different cycles here over the last few years, right? You had the COVID thing. Uh, we had uh, we had some disruptions in our organization that we couldn't control, and then we had this this year's economic decline. And I, I think when we saw the market starting to take a downward trend, uh, we looked at ourselves and said, all right, so what can we do with a successful phase two trial in hand to position the company most effectively for success going forward? And what we chose to do was to really hit the accelerator pedal on uh, non-clinical research and being able to tell the story more effectively. So getting more results and uh, getting more data that gives uh, potential investors and strategic partners more comfort about what we're doing, because it is a new thing. It's hard for people to understand. And I'll give you an example of that. We um, had a really neat result in our clinical trial where we hit a um, Shermer's responder rate and it was a very, very natural result for the patients in one month. We knew that the only way that could have happened is because of a repair of the corneal nerve structure. So we did a non-clinical study in mice that showed dramatic recovery of corneal nerves after a major damage event had occurred over a period of two weeks. And that uh, new corneal nerve data has been eye-opening for us and for potential partners. So it's really helped us out a lot. It's very exciting. Yeah. So what's what's next? I mean, as we're coming down, everyone's saying 12 months, maybe 14 months. Right. Right. What are you excited about? What's What are you going to load an apple cart on? Yeah, I think uh, there's a couple of things that are going on for us. We're, we're in active discussions and partnering for back of eye, particularly neuroprotection, but also in the front of the eye. Uh, we've got opportunities in the Far East that look very, very good for us. Uh, we hope to close those over the next 60 days. Uh, we are um, pursuing financing so that we can execute the phase three clinical trial for the dry eye product. And then I think um, everything depends upon what additional non-dilutive or strategic partner relationships that we're able to negotiate because we've got the opportunities with glaucoma. We're very well advanced in our discussions with the FDA on new endpoints and an opportunity to do a trial in neuroprotection. We've got the opportunities for intraretinal uh, repair and recovery, which are very exciting for us. And we now, as a result of some test results that we just got over the weekend previously, have got new opportunities in myopia. So very exciting days for us. I think for us, it's about funding priorities and making sure that we don't uh, spread ourselves too thin. Yeah, that's the, that's the biggest challenge for yeah, all of us. Right. Terrific. It was a pleasure seeing you. Great to see you. And uh, hopefully we'll catch up again next year. Absolutely. Take care. Congratulations. You bet. So hello all. Uh, my name is Sharon Bakalash. I'm an eye surgeon by trade and uh, the CEO of SB Strategic Development uh, Consultants. I'm here today with uh, Dr. Rania Habash, who's an ophthalmologist, fellow ophthalmologist, a woman of all trades, the Renaissance woman of ophthalmology, and uh, I would love to learn more about what she has been up to lately uh, and uh, all the uh, different hats that you're wearing currently. So let's start with that. Okay, well, um, it's great to be here with you, Sharon. Uh, I'm a big fan of yours and uh, you just rocked your panel just now. So um, thank you for having me. Thanks for uh, the interview here. Um, I am doing a lot of things uh, just as usual because um, you know, when you're just really passionate about medicine, you know, uh, you can't really say no to anything. <laughs> but th that's not really true. I mean, I, uh, I take on things that I, I feel have a lot of value and will actually change the world that have a big impact. And so it keeps me very busy, but that's the way I like it. That, that's the way to go. So let, let's uh, talk a little bit about MetaMed. Uh, where, where is MetaMed standing now? What, it, what are you guys looking for? Uh, where does uh, Metamed uh, find the, the current situation uh, in the ophthalmology microcosm? 
Okay, yeah, great. Well, MetaMed was um, a little side project, really, <laughs> at first. Um, but this thing, I mean, I am literally trying not to spend too much time on it, but it's impossible. I mean, everybody wants a piece. Um, everybody wants to be involved. And it's because we've shown real value in the metaverse. And right now, everyone thinks the metaverse is really just for gaming and social media. But it's not, you know, and uh, we do these amazing things. We've built some incredible things already. For instance, um, every single week we do Retinaverse rounds where we invite KOLs from around the world to share 3D surgical cases. Wow. They, they show their surgical cases in 3D and all these other KOLs show up and we're they show up as avatars. <laughs> and so everybody's sitting there in the crowd, for, you know, as an avatar on a space station, which is the. The, the auditorium that we built on the space station. Um, and we have representatives from like all the major institutions in the country and some from around the world. Now we're starting to get like medical students and residents from all over the place um, who are coming in as well. It's been incredible. I mean, you know, people just the best, the greats in the industry sharing their surgical cases um, and doing, you know, ed surgical education and mentoring for others all in the metaverse. It's fantastic. It is fantastic. Yeah. So I also know that precision medicine is one of your passions. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about that uh, avenue that you're pursuing? Yeah, um, to me, precision medicine is the future. Um, we weren't able to do it as much in the past because we didn't have the computational power, you know, the sophistication with algorithms and that sort of thing. But now we are. And so, um, you know, precision medicine or predictive analytics, um, digital twinning, all of that was already being done in other industries uh, forever, you know, manufacturing, the auto industry, et cetera, um, financial industries, but it hadn't been really done in medicine yet. I'm going to change that <laughs> because, you know, going back to your session just now, I mean, the best way to do neuroprotection is prevention. <laughs> so, right, you know, right. you can, you can neuroprotect all you want, but you know, if you, if you have the opportunity to detect the disease in a patient and predict disease progression, then you can go back and take the measures that uh, will keep them from ever developing it in the first place. And so in what areas of ophthalmology are you looking for this precision medicine aspect of? Um, yeah. Well, glaucoma is a really big one. You know, as you know, um, glaucoma is so multimodal. Um, we have to sit there in the clinic with the patient and synthesize all this information at one time which is fine, but um, that's what algorithms are for, right? That's what, right. what computers right. are for. They help us to kind of bring all that information together. But then going um, further than that, you know, a patient is not just their eyeball. They are a composite of everything that makes them who they are. You know, um, Microsoft actually just came out with a study um, recently that said, which is, more, which is more important, your genetic code or your zip code in determining your health? Actually, turns out it's your zip code. Yes, yes. <laughs> because how or where you live affects how you live. And so that actually makes up a greater chunk of like determining where a patient will be in 15 or 20 years with their disease. Um, my answer to that is, you know, what's, what's even better than the two alone is the two together. <laughs> so now combining clinical data plus genetic data plus lifestyle uh, data, social determinants of health, et cetera, now you really get a feel for where a patient will end up and the best way to treat them for different things. And is this what you're doing right now at Avellino? Yeah, um, <laughs> that's, the, uh, that's what Avellino is all about. I mean, they're the, the leader in genetic testing for the eye. So just starting with that, I mean, uh, you know, they all laugh at me when I say this, but uh, genetic testing is, or genetics is the DNA of precision medicine. <laughs> you can't do it without the genetics. Um, and they've already figured that part out. They have the data analytics. I'm coming in to help improve that um, and to do almost, uh, I mean, to pull in different sources of information. So now the clinical data, the imaging data, um, and then the pharmaceutical data as well. So we can predict who's going to do better with certain drugs um, than others. That That's great. Specifically in the field of glaucoma, where uh, current studies uh, are focused only on IOP. Uh, they're fa they're actually facing huge, huge uh, uh, sample sizes with long-term follow-ups, and they're often encountering very indecisive results considering they're taking 
uh, open angle glaucoma, which we all know is a syndrome, is not one disease. Exactly. So yes. I, I think that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> That's why I loved your panel, because we were speaking exactly the same language. You really get it. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm really excited about that, because right now, uh, to the traditional uh, cohort of neuroprotection uh, companies that have been around, uh, there is an additional uh, uh, sidewind or backwind from gene therapy, cell therapy, uh, genetic testing, uh, and, and that kind of like brings to the, to the surface um, the need for precision medicine, the need for algorithmic selection of patients. And uh, I, I think that that will, at the end of the day, uh, create much more innovation in the field once, uh, once it's approved by FDA as, as uh, valid endpoints. That's exactly right. I mean, look, it could even be a companion uh, for right now, you know, in, in use along with the other machines that we use. But this is the future of medicine. I mean, this is the real exciting thing. That's what gets me out of bed in the morning, you know, knowing that we have this potential to change medicine in our hands. And we're, we're, we're standing at this tipping point right now, like you right. said, you know, where, um, you know, we're, we're at the forefront of just changing the paradigm of how everything is done. Right, right. Completely yeah. agreed. Um, I want to switch gears for a minute. Uh, we all know the current uh, microcosm of investments is very challenging and has been challenging for the past year. Um, what kind of advice do you have as somebody who stood on the other side of the fence uh, for uh, entrepreneurs uh, in the field that are facing those, those challenges? Yeah, uh, thank you for that. <laughs> That was a tough period. Um, you know, I um, I still think and I still maintain that um, the cream rises to the top. You know, and a lot of times in these um, in these bad times with with investing, uh, I still think that the good companies and the good ideas will still rise to the top. They'll shine. You know, it's almost like the bad stuff falls away and then you have the good things left over. Um, certainly mine was a good thing as well, um, but I still couldn't, you know, uh, oh, I don't like this question. <laughs> <laughs> You're editing us? <laughs> <laughs> I know. It was still a really tough situation. Look, I, I mean, I would just say um, the best advice I can give is something that somebody told me a long time ago. The bad news is nothing lasts forever. The good news is nothing lasts forever. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with that. Um, and yet, um, considering we are at OIS, uh, and this is the first time we're having a two full days of OIS together, uh, what are your thoughts about how this venue specifically can progress or can advance uh, young innovation, um, uh, budding uh, technologies uh, to, to move forward despite the situation? Yeah, the, thanks for the softball question after the last one. But, uh, <laughs> you know, when you get a room full of entrepreneurs, investors, you know, all the clinical leaders in the field, I mean, that is just a perfect recipe for uh, innovation. You know, and, and so we've heard about stuff today. I mean, I, I like to think I'm pretty like uh, in the know. I have my finger on the pulse when it comes to new technologies. And I've been surprised by new things in the field today. And um, and that's amazing. You know, I love seeing that. I love um, I love seeing where things can go in the future um, and, and having people who are not even from our field uh, there sometimes, you know, and, and they have newer ideas, newer ways of thinking about things. And that's really refreshing. So. Yeah, I'm all for uh, forums like this. Yes, I agree with you. Today was a, a, a great uh, <laughs> showcase of both forums of venture capitalists that, that gave uh, advice uh, of um, people with huge amount of acumen uh, with regards to making deals, developing technologies, um, as well as an opportunity to see small companies uh, small startups that are just starting to see uh, even even if they are uh, newcomers to the field. So that was very refreshing. I agree with you. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, the time and the energy and I look forward <laughs> to, to more. Oh, definitely. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, it's an honor to be here with you. But um, same here. I feel like same we could here. talk for hours. So thank yes. you so much for this opportunity. Thank so. you. Thank you. Bye. 
here today interviewing Daphne Chaim Langford, who's a longtime friend uh, and the CEO and founder of Tarsia Pharma. Hello, Daphne. Hi, Sharon. Thank you. Uh, it's great to be here at OIS. Uh, this uh, fabulous two-day weekend, hearing all the innovation that's, uh, that's happening. And I was uh, wanting to um, learn more about Tarsia Pharma, specifically when we start talking about the current uh, product that is the most uh, advanced uh, uh, in development, which is 001. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about where this stands right now? Sure. So uh, TRS-01 is the eye drop formulation of our new chemical entity, which is the TRS, that has a disruptive mechanism of action. And we are focusing in a blockbuster potential, which is uh, patients with UVT glaucoma. Um, currently running our TRS-4 vision, which is a phase three clinical trial here in the US, but also in Germany and France. We are working with uh, KOL in uveitis, uh, with our professional teams, and um, past the midway of the trial, we are randomizing patients at all age groups, including young kids. Our wow. youngest today is a seven-year-old boy, and it's very touching. And uh, we have some very severe diseased patients. Um, and this is where we are. This is very exciting news. But uh, going back as to where you, where you started uh, this journey, um, Getting investors, getting interest around a, a, a disease like uh, uveitis or uveitis glaucoma uh, is not an easy task. Tell us uh, what, uh, what turned the tides for you? How were you able to turn it into a success story? So uveitis and uveitis glaucoma is the end stage of uveitis. And indeed, uveitis is dominated by steroids. And it's very difficult to convince that there is a market uh, because of steroids pricing is not that high. So we are looking at UVT glaucoma. It's the end stage disease of uveitis. Two thirds of patients will reach an, an severe uh, visual impairment and 10 to 15% of all cases of blindness are due to uveitis. And UVT glaucoma um, is when the inflammatory cells are invading the eye. We have a few uveitis flare-up that can only be treated with steroids topically, and that leads to intraocular pressure elevation and glaucoma. And now we have an eye with two severe diseases, uveitis and glaucoma. And the next flare-up of uveitis and active disease, we need more steroids. And we are reaching a vicious cycle of inflammation, steroids, and glaucoma, that leads to blindness. And with our TRSO1 program, which is a non-steroidal without IOP elevation, we hope to stop this vicious cycle and preserve sight for those uh, patients with uh, UVT glaucoma. How were you able to recruit um, investor interest around this, uh, considering, again, this, this is not a very uh, prevalent um, disease? So UVT glaucoma, in terms of number of patients, uh, we have in the U.S. around 120,000 patients. And with a line of sight of potential um, positive readouts of our phase three clinical trial during 2023, indeed, the market for UVT glaucoma is the big question. What, how the market may look like. And to do that, I will take you to the latest story of Tepeza that uh, was launched two years ago. And like UVT glaucoma, thyroid eye disease was a greenfield with an unsophisticated and under-treated under patients that um, had no hope for patients. And this is exactly the same case for UVT glaucoma patients. And Tepeza, as you know, it's the fifth blockbuster drug in ophthalmology. And I believe that uh, this story, but also the Dompe Oxivate story, led the way to investors to understand that there is a new horizon uh, for innovations in ophthalmology, which are new chemical entities with a uh, green field in terms of indications. This is very impressive. So in, in parallel, you've also started uh, developing some intravitreal injections for DME. 
uh, uh, for NPDR, for dry AMD. Uh, tell us a bit about the mechanism of actions for those uh, new developments, uh, new, new products in the pipeline. Is this the same? Is this different? So the TRS molecule is a conjugate of two active compounds, tafcin and phosphorylcholine, and it's a multi-target drug that affects the immune system by four different uh, compounds, uh, processes, actually. Uh, we have macrophages shift from inflammatory to anti-inflammatory. Uh, the TRS also inhibit the NF-kappa B cascade through toll-like receptor 4. It suppresses the ACE2 receptor and it has high affinity to noropylin 1, which reduces the activity of VEGF. So all of those four targets are definitely relevant in the processes that leads to diabetic-related retinal diseases. Uh, we recently uh, completed the development of the TRSO2 formulation, which is a proprietary biodegradable slow-release formulation. Uh, we found a favorable safety profile in the rabbit model, and our pharmacokinetic in rabbits uh, met our target product profile. And practically, we have the same release profile in rabbits as of uh, Ozodex, which is a dexamethasone implant approved for diabetic macular edema. So encouraged by this, we are currently gearing up toward R&D enabling studies and hopefully yeah, we will reach first in human in the near term future. Well, good luck on that. That sounds very promising and uh, provides also an alternative for the eternal anti-VEGF uh, medication that are the only potential um, drugs in the market along with Ozerdex uh, currently. Um, last but not least, very important, um, uh, what, what are key elements uh, for success, in your opinion, in the current environment for innovators uh, today? I will be very specific with regards to innovation in ophthalmology, and I think that the key success element is innovation in all aspects. Um, from endpoints in different indications, the molecule, of course, there is a a great need for new molecules, new mechanism of actions for indications that were in the past weren't served at all. Um, and to reach a level of innovation, I believe that the key is diversity. We need to have gender diversity, but also age diversity. Uh, it should the diversity should be as part of the management of the companies, senior management board of directors, key opinion leaders, and uh, scientific advisory boards, and as many different groups from the uh, from uh, gender and age will be part of the journey of innovative companies will join this journey, I think that we will see more innovation and more successful companies. Well, thank you very much. This was insightful. I uh, wish you all the success and uh, bringing new and um, very, very uh, important medications to patients' lives. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sharon. I'm here today with Mina Such from Occupier, CEO of Occupier, uh, who I have been wanting to interview for a long time, so thank you for taking the time. You're welcome. Uh, and with that said, uh, I get to ask all the interesting questions. So first of all, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, you've just uh, signed an exclusive, an exclusive agreement for Nyxol, uh, for reversal of Midriazes, presbyopia, night vision with Viatris. Yep. And with that said, uh, I wanted to understand, um, considering the fact that you're partnering with a partner that's outside ophthalmology, how do you envision each company uh, capabilities would enable a successful adoption in the market? Yeah, thank you. So first, I just wanted to share that um, this deal is quite transformative for Occupier. Uh, we're four years old and two years we've been a public company and this really enabled a lot of things. And one, and most importantly, it really validated all this positive data that we've been generating on Nixol over the last two years across reversal medresis, presbyopia, and night vision. Actually, we had four phase three trials across those indications and one phase two. And so Beatrice really, through the due diligence they and Famigen did really allowed us as well as some other parties, um, you know, our kind of the opportunity for us to 
really under appreciate the data that we've generated and see that this uh, what we've been doing is really quite valuable to the market. But it, more importantly than that in the transaction, Beatrice actually provided funding, both upfront, milestones, full funding of our development, and that really, again, in this current climate, really provides the strength of a balance sheet that is exciting for us as we continue to develop both Nixall and APX, and maybe third and most importantly as a commercial partner. So uh, we achieved the opportunity to have a U.S. partner, which is what we were seeking in the partnership minimally. We got all these other things as well, but also a global partner. Uh, they're in 160 countries, and Beatrice is um, so really excited on those three objectives that are met. But I do want to uh, comment on your question about a new player. I think uh, ophthalmology desperately needed another new strategic. It's a 17 billion revenue company. They are uh, generate two to three billion of free cash flow a quarter. They are uh, historically a generic business. They were the old Mylan Labs that merged with Upjohn, for those of you who may not recognize the Beatrice name. It's two years old as a new branded name. And they've been looking for growth areas and they chose ophthalmology, GI, and derm. But they basically this year, uh, they decided on that and they basically executed with under a year that strategy by acquiring Oyster Point, which has the third largest uh, sales force and approved nasal product, and then a portfolio of assets, which we were the next three in the in the pipeline. Uh, and uh, so we get to be number two, three, and maybe even number four in the bag of the enhanced Beatrice um, you know, ophthalmology business. So to the space, it's fantastic to have a new player with resources, commitment, not just in the US, but around the world. And for us to be able to have that commercial partner, especially in the US, that's already beginning to sell one product and now can add another product. So I think there's gonna be a lot of good because our capabilities are drug development, regulatory manufacturing, and finding these good assets. Their capabilities, combined with Oyster Point and their other resources, is definitely regulatory, late stage regulatory around the world, commercial around the world, and manufacturing as well. So that's refreshing to hear that there is a new strategic in town, uh, and there is a, there is hope and a future for smaller companies uh, in, in actually arriving at the market globally and not just in the U.S. So what's the good, the bad, and the ugly in partnering with uh, with a company that's outside of some uh, ophthalmology? Yeah, so I'm going to say there's probably more good than bad or ugly. Um, I think, you know, just on the learning curve, uh, obviously there will be a learning curve for them to understand the relationships, this community, but I think through the Oyster Point uh, acquisition, that's really their foundation, which they already have have all of those, if you're, as you've heard Jeff now and others talk about their long-standing history in ophthalmology mm -hmm. and his team and his sales force and our team as well as well as other uh, um, uh, development pipeline candidates are all folks that have been in the ophthalmology business for a long time. So I think the bad would have been that they're completely new, they don't understand the unmet need, the doctors, how things work or the regulatory division, but they have the acquired assets and company representatives to really provide that gap. So I really think the good is you've got a fresh look and um, commitment and were so important I should say that they said that they would like in their November 7th press release that they would like ophthalmology to be a one billion dollar revenue unit for them by 2028 so they are fully committed to grow the uh, nasal uh, dry eye product of oyster points our products and all of us contributing hopefully to that target so I think that's the good is just an opportunity for someone looking at this for growth and not one of 10 units that they're not sure what to do with. So I, I really think it's fabulous. And they also wanted to get into prescription branded products with patent lives and, and move away from some of the generic um, history. And all of, our, uh, unit, uh, all of our products in ophthalmology allow that. Everything is prescription approved products. And they're also a very unique uh, point of view in actually um, acquiring Oyster Point uh, and uh, actually partnering with you and that is shying away from the the traditional uh, route of administration looking into um, you know the nasal delivery in your case looking at the portfolio products uh, you're, you're actually um, developing a drug that's an oral drug for DME which is yeah, so that product is not part of the partnership. Okay. So uh, our partnership was solely on Nixall, and that was by choice. Uh, we are about to have an early readout, a uh, readout in early 2023 on a very disruptive phase two trial that we've run in diabetic patients. So our APX product is outside. So it's truly a license on Nixall. Okay. And we continue to manage the development work, but it's fully funded and reimbursed until it gets to approval. So really leveraging our team strength and execution over the last couple of years. But just want to clarify that uh, Nick uh, Occupier is still a independent company, kind of business as usual, but now we have this partnership with 
Famigen slash Beatrice uh, on the entire Nixall program. Yeah, that, the world. That, that's a point well made. So tell me a little bit more about APX uh, 3300. So is that, um, you know, what's the benefit and the risk for of developing such a device, uh, such a product? Yeah, so uh, APX 3300 is an asset I brought in about two years ago. Yeah. I brought Nixall in four years ago. Um, we've been highly productive in advancing assets. So this is a drug that's oral. So let's just pause there yeah, for a second. For so instead of injections in the eye that are VEGF only in their mechanisms, this is an anti-VEGF, an anti-inflammatory mechanism in an oral route or product. And what's really nice about the asset and from a risk perspective or de-risk perspective is that we actually brought it in when there were already 11 clinical trials completed, 20 preclinical trials, and it was by ASI in Japan as well as Apexion in Indiana. And it was in liver, healthy, and cancer patients. So all of that data is, is really gives you confidence in the safety profile of the drug and some of its underlying mechanistic properties. And then we are the first to do a 12 study, which is our first study in ophthalmology called Zeta-1, this well-controlled phase 2B study with 100 subjects that'll read out early next year. So I think what's really exciting about APX is we're gonna provide a option, a treatment option, where today diabetic retinopathy patients are basically left untreated, more in a wait and monitor, because usually the anti-VEGF injections are used at DME or wet AMD. They're not used at this earlier stage of, uh, of retinal disease, in particular in the diabetic retinopathy yeah, so patients. Th there's definitely an unmet need uh, the question would be if that positioning, and again, it's premature because we don't have a readout of the study, but uh, would that be a replacement for the traditional anti veggies Would that, that be a supplement for that? Yeah, great question. No, it's not a replacement. So first of all, they're not prescribing or injecting diabetic patients today that are diabetic right now at this stage. So all the docs can, can do as many anti-VEGF injections they want on the wet AMD patients and the DMA patients, the ARVO patients. And so with the new GA products, they can inject obviously if those get approved uh, for the, um, you know, with the Pellis or Iverix products. So our opportunity is to treat the patient earlier with an oral, provide better compliance, which is a huge deal. And really the earlier you intervene in the disease, there's a lot of correlations between um, avoiding vision threatening diseases, which is really what you wanna do is not get them to vision loss and a permanent loss of vision. So we're really excited that where we're gonna fit is very complementary to the existing landscape by adding something new. But if we do decide to go after DME or wet AMD, which is very logical extension, right. you could see us working alongside those drugs, get the patient dry with those injections and then be on APX 330 yeah. in the background, twice a day tablets at home. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's really how we envision it. So we really do think we work really nicely and fit into the landscape both for patients and physicians. So you, ha but you have another uh, product that's an IVT, uh, which is uh, 2900. Uh, on top of the um, the, the 3300, the oral. Yeah, so, so on our pipeline chart, we have multiple pipeline candidates, 2009, 2014, and a few others that came out of, again, Apexion and Dr. Mark Kelly's lab. All of that is part of the license that we have at Occupier. And we have been excited in, uh, to start working in the new year with more funding on the either an IVT delivery, another local delivery, or maybe a sustained delivery. There's a lot of great technology, some of here at the OIS conference. And so rather than invent a delivery technology, we could potentially put our pipeline candidates in there because the mechanism of APX is so novel. It's a REF1 inhibitor, it's a novel target, which is a transcription factor regulator of HIF1-alpha and of kappa B. So it sits upstream of the anti-VEGF and the anti-inflammatory pathways, but it doesn't affect normal cells. You have to be over-exaggerated, over-expressed for it to come into play. So that mechanism, we're giving it orally, and right now our data is quite safe, so it's, we're excited, but you can see that a local delivery of some form would also make sense, whether with APX 330 or with the pipeline. So with the funding we now have, we can actually do more work on the pipeline uh, candidates and or local delivery in 2023. We're excited to do that. Well, thank you so much. This has been enlightening. Uh, you've got an exciting portfolio. We can't wait. I think I, I speak for the whole uh, community of ophthalmology to hear more about this because this is going to be groundbreaking for patients in earlier stages of the disease, uh, patients who are going to enjoy um, more friendly ways of administering uh, medication. And uh, I, I'm looking forward to have another conversation with you pretty soon about those. Uh, yeah, so I was going to say thank you, Sharon. I just wanted to add, I think, that our goal was to be disruptive. Nothing we've Got done is for me to mechanisms or crowded market spaces. We really wanted to go after aging population, everyday vision, presbyopia, reversing dilation, night vision, the halos and glares, and 
in the um, retina space to go after that big unmet need of alternatives to injections with an oral and really help the diabetic growing population around the world. So thank you. Well, you, you got our imagination going for sure. Exactly. So thank you so, so much. Awesome. <laughs> I'm here today with uh, Professor Praveen Dougal. Uh, we're old friends. I'm so happy to interview you uh, and ask all the good, big questions that uh, uh, you know we can only do when one on one. There so thank you so much. Um, and uh, maybe we should start on. Absolutely, Sharon. Thank you. It's great to see you as old friends again. Yes. And uh, thank you for including me. Absolutely, it's our pleasure. So, first of all, congratulations. You've received uh, the breakthrough designation for Zimora, for GA, for geographic atrophy. Um, that's, that's a great fit. Um, can you tell us more details about it? Can you share more? Yes, yeah, so we're delighted to get breakthrough designation. Uh, as you know, that's the highest uh, level that you can get from the FDA. And what it does is it does two things for us. It validates our, our data, and it also allows us a clear path we believe for regulatory approval. So the validation of the data is because they base the breakthrough based on the clinical module. So it's a clinical review of our data, which is gather one and gather two. And the the efficiency of the submission comes in because it's the entire FDA. So if there are questions, not just in ophthalmology, but say in uh, CMC, if there are questions in toxicology, we'll be first in line for that. So. Uh, we're very, very pleased with this, in, both in terms of the validation as well as the, uh, the, 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 the fastness that I think we'll have in terms of regulatory approval. So how, how does that actually affect the pathway going forward for commercialization uh, of getting this uh, uh, with, with patients and um, basically um, giving that uh, much needed uh, therapeutic for, for GA? Well, we have, Zamora is the only asset that has two positive phase three studies um, and in, in geographic atrophy. Now we've got breakthrough designation after having received a SPA. So we really believe that we have a clear regulatory path forward. And we believe uh, that we have a good chance of being first to market. Uh, we have developed our commercial team. We have developed our uh, medical team. Uh, we're adding on to that, of course, uh, but we are developing this asset uh, as it will be, as we believe it will be first to market. Is there any timelines for getting this uh, in the market? So uh, the it, all I can tell you is that the submission will be completed uh, as we publicly announced uh, completely by the end of uh, this year. So actually this month. Wow. Um, and then it will be under review by the FDA. Um, and again, with breakthrough status, we believe that will be uh, very expeditious. Great. So this is a complement five inhibitor. Correct. Uh, how does that, um, how does this more effect differ from other complement inhibitors that are in development right now? Yeah, really good question. So, um, you know, if you look at the complement pathway, it looks complicated, but it's actually quite redundant. So there are three independent pathways that kind of come together at C3 and then C5 and then separate out into two uh, systems that kill cells, which is the membrane attack complex and then flamosome system. We've always felt that if you preserve as much of the complement pathway as possible, um, you will get the benefits of the efficacy as well as the safety profile. And so we believe that, uh, yes, you can inhibit higher. Uh, if you inhibit too high, then that inhibition may be overcome by redundancy. Uh, if you inhibit uh, lower but higher than C5, and then you're restricting some of the other complement mechanisms that are very important for safety and efficacy. And I think that proves out. I think our gather one and gather two studies are completely distinguished uh, by their efficacy profile as well as their safety profile. And I know that with when looking at uh, Varic Bio's uh, portfolio, you're also going for um, um, other genetic diseases, uh, you're going for star guards. Uh, how does the effect differ or is it the same with uh, targeting GA and, and genetic diseases? So we don't know yet because that study is still ongoing. It's a study in Stargardt's disease. But as you know, there are very many similarities uh, biologically between Stargardt's disease and macular degeneration. Um, so we're encouraged that we'll have positive results knowing what we have from, uh, from the GA experience. We also have had very productive communications with the FDA in regards to intermediate macular degeneration. Our goal is not just to go ahead and target GA, 
but to change the entire course of the disease by targeting earlier stages such as intermediate macular degeneration. And we've done some retrospective analyses of the GATA1 study that seem to suggest that Zumura will have a very positive effect on intermediate macular degeneration. And based on that, um, our interactions of, with the FDA have been such that we have recently announced that we don't think we need to do a separate study in intermediate macular degeneration and that the strength of the GATA1 and GATA2 data alone will be sufficient for us to target intermediate macular degeneration. That's, that's fascinating. So um, in your iOS, uh, in your OIS uh, podcast, uh, you talked about taking calculated risks. Uh, how have these calculated risks uh, paid uh, off for a varied buyer thus far? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the, the calculated risk, if you want to put it that way, is simply believing in the science and believing in the data. Um, we believed in the complement science. We certainly believed in the GATA1 data. I know there were questions, uh, and probably appropriately so, because all other drugs had failed in geographic atrophy at that time. And not only do we succeed with the two milligram dose in GATA1, but we also succeeded with the four milligram dose uh, to a very, very uh, confident level uh, statistically. And we replicated that now in GATA2. So I think, I, I don't know if it's a risk or a calculated risk, it's really a belief. Uh, you've got to believe in your science, you've yeah. got to believe in your data, and I think that's what we did. Yeah. So touching on the GATHER2 uh, and uh, the result presented for a 12-month follow-up, um, how do you see the differentiation of Zimura versus uh, all other competition? Yeah, I think w what was really neat about uh, and very encouraging about GATHER2 is that it replicated uh, what we had hoped for, which is the efficacy profile as well as the safety profile, which both completely distinguish us uh, from other complement inhibitors. The efficacy profile is such that there's an immediate separation with the very first measurement, and that delta gets bigger and bigger and bigger with time. We saw that in GATHER1, and we saw that in GATHER2 as well. As far as safety is concerned, we have the lowest rate of conversion to wet macular degeneration, again, wow. replicated in GATHER2. Uh, but equally importantly, uh, and I want to emphasize this, there are zero cases of inflammation. And I don't mean just low, I mean absolutely zero. There are zero cases of drug-related inflammation in GATHER1, and there are zero uh, drug-related inflammation in, in GATHER2. So we, we think that our efficacy profile and our safety profile is certainly completely distinguished. Yes, that's very impressive. Uh, and now going back into the early stage portfolio products that you're uh, um, developing right now, I understand that you're also developing AAV gene therapy modalities uh, for genetic retinal diseases. Does that, does that signify a strategic direction change for Averic Bio? Uh, how do you see the future in that respect? Yes, yeah, so we have, we have two um, gene therapy products that we feel are fairly close to being in humans. One is for retinitis pigmentosa and the other is for best disease. And with all of the developments in Zamora, we've made a strategic decision that, look, we just simply don't have the resources um, or the time, frankly, uh, to forward those products as they deserve to be forward. So what we've said is we'll look for a partnership opportunity to forward those products. And I think that's the right thing to do to get it to patients as soon as possible. We also have a mini gene program that is in its preclinical stages and that is going along very, very well. It doesn't require very much, re very much in terms of resources from us, and that, that we will continue to go ahead and keep. Um, as, far as, uh, as far as other um, pipeline entities are concerned, our goal here is to uh, manage the life cycle of Zamora. And we've already announced a collaboration with Delsatec. Um, undoubtedly, we're gonna have other collaborative opportunities uh, in terms of sustained delivery to go ahead and prolong that Zumora life cycle and also increase the target patient population as we go earlier and earlier uh, in macular degeneration. Well, thank you so much. This is fascinating. It's fascinating to see Averic Bios evolving, uh, developing, uh, collaborating, and it's very, very impressive what you've done this far. And uh, we look forward to hearing more in the future. Thank you so much. Sharon, thank you. Again, nothing better than talking to old friends. And uh, <laughs> thank you for having me here. It's my pleasure. It's our pleasure at OIS. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the OIS podcast. Tune in next week as we chat science, medicine, and industry with ophthalmology's leading experts.
Visit OIS.net for more information on podcasts, events, and exciting new features.